Hi, my name is Hearts, and welcome to Tiny Bunny. This is a visual horror novel. Um, hopefully, this bunny does not scare the crap out of us, but if it does, content, right? <laughs> but uh, it has really great reviews on Steam, so I think we should just go ahead and just hop right in and see what this bunny is all about. Spoopy, spoopy, spoopy. The wind clawed up my window all night long. It wandered the fields and howled like a hungry beast. An endless song weaved from all sorts of voices, shrill, gentle, sneery, twined in the air. They were shouting and laughing and arguing about something. Someone was running through the snow while casting long shadows that would occasionally creep close to my bed. Our house had a mind of its own, the creaky old mind of a building that had seen a lot in its days, and was seemingly trying to share its wisdom with the inhabitants. The lonely house faced the forest, and the dark green thicket gazed back with its hollow eyes, hollow, hollow eyes, rustling, whizzing, swaying back and forth. One could come out and stand at the edge of the forest to reassure themselves there was nobody behind the crooked trees. Fuzzy silhouettes, silhouettes swaying in the wind couldn't possibly do any harm. It's just a play of light and shadow. Just a play. I knew it was just my imagination. I was already 12 after all. Still. That's a wolf. Hey, put away your book. How many times have I told you not to read at the table? It's bad for your health. Look at how slouched you are. What if I don't want to hide my book? I don't really want to. Mom, you're kind of hot. I just want to throw that out there. I didn't protest and put the book about Conan the Barbarian aside. I was stuck in a line I couldn't understand after reading it three times anyway. Olya had already finished her breakfast and was munching on some cookies. She was so enthusiastic, she almost looked like your typical girl from commercials. You're not going anywhere until you finish all of it. I, on the other hand, was still trying to drill a hole in the plate with my eyes, as if it would make the porridge disappear. Hazy anxiousness welled up inside, all because of the previous sleepless night, the black forest around our house, and the gloomy wind. The longer I waited, the colder the lumpy white substance became. It looked like a jellyfish from the... Holy shit words. Calstu Odyssey? Castal Odyssey? Ah, Castal Odyssey? I fucked up Odyssey more than I fucked up the first word. I love that show. I wonder how horrifying the bottom of the ocean is. Or how cold the black forest is at night. The spoon fell out of my hand. Mom showered me with a cold glare from her green eyes. What did I just say? I'll get it. I had ten seconds to catch my breath before battling the nasty porridge again. I felt around for the spoon. What is this carved on the other side of the table? Karina. Hey, that's my mom's name. I guess she carved it out with something pointy when she was little. She sure was a rascal, damaging the furniture like that. She would scold me for a week if I did something similar, though. Should I remind her about it? No, she's been in a bit of, of a bad mood lately. I managed, uh, I imagined her being my age, sitting under this table. I wonder, was Mom afraid of the dark back then? Or the sounds coming from the attic? Or the thick forest? I imagined my grandma coming into my little mom's room, sitting at the edge of her bed where Ola, Ola, 
Olya sleeps nowadays and saying this in her soft, smooth voice. Olya. Olya. What kind of name is Olya? Tega is a special place, little girl. It's watching you closely, sniffing you out, trying to discern what kind of beast you are. If you're a good sort, it won't abandon you in times of trouble. But if you're a bad apple, it'll grab you by the side and drag you under the ground. And that would be it. Grandma was caring. She never fought with anybody, never yelled, never swore. Those were the times without the maddening screams until late at night, without smash dishes and mutual accusations. Our parents used to love each other back then. I remember listening in on one of their conversations by chance. They were talking about Grandma getting prepared for her funeral. She had already bought a casket, and she called it her cute funeral box. It waited for its time in the closet, patiently. It was black, upholstered with meat-colored material on the inside. I saw it when my grandma was getting buried. The house didn't change since the time she was alive. Only all of the photos were gone. <clears throat> Glass-covered pictures with gray faces of my ancestors. They all had, had a dead. They all had a dead but watchful look in their eyes. I crawled out from under the table. Olya was done with her cookies and was looking at my share like a sly woodland critter. I turned my gaze towards her, toward the frosted window. There were a lot of dark pines outside, but they didn't grab my attention. The pattern of frost formed a picture on the glass. <clears throat> Olya, look, it's a fox. Where? It looked almost like those optical illusion thingies they put on the back of student notebooks. A mixture of lines at first glance, but if you blur your vision a little bit, and look under a certain angle. Not outside, on the window. Look, here's the nose and here's... Hey, eat up. Yes, yes, just a moment. I don't see anything. Hurry up, there's not much left. Ah, there it is, but it still doesn't look like one. And I'm telling you, it does. Nuh-uh, it does. Stop it, these kids, I swear. Now I couldn't see the fox either. It disappeared. Went away. Only the frosty pattern similar to stretched out nettle leaves kept creeping up the glass. My dad entered the kitchen with long, measured steps. I want to have a beer like his when I grow up. Mom would always ask jokingly, Come on, shave it off, it stings. This was so long ago. Nowadays, rumbling doors and witty comebacks were an everyday occurrence. Olga always covers her ears whenever she hears something like, What's the point in all this? Through the wall. It's all for your sake, Dad would reply, for the sake of our family. I always caught every sound in fear of hearing the most dreaded, the deadliest word that started with a D. D-I-V-O. I don't even want to finish it. It was scary to imagine that me and my little sister could be torn apart and taken into two different families. Anyway, your fox is nothing. I have an owl in my window. You and your owl talk again. You said you believed me just yesterday. Has anybody seen my car keys? I remember leaving them in the windowsill. Right. Maybe you did, and maybe not. You're a grown man, a father of two, and still... Karina, please, stop. Just let me get ready in peace. Your keys are in the basket, near the phone. Well, thank you very much. Antoine, stop making a martyr of yourself and finish eating already. And the owl? There was no owl. But there was one. It had giant glowing eyes. Olga sprung from the chair and placed her hands on her little face, imitating a pair of eyes with her fingers the size of an apple each. Last year you had Babai in your closet, and now this owl? But, but I saw it. Olga shifted her gaze back and forth from dad to mom to me, but couldn't find any support. Have you thought about befriending it? You know, like feeding it with imaginary mice? Don't bully our girl. She's just afraid to sleep alone because she's still little. Olya pouted her lips in rebellion and rushed into the hallway. The staircase that had led to the second floor creaked. 
Mom gave Dad a strict look. Oh, that look in her eyes. It's so uncomfortable to be pinned under it. Dad just snorted in reply and left, ringing with the keys he just found. A minute had passed, and the theme song from The Little Mermaid echoed through the, eh, echoed, echoed through the house. It was stored on incredibly worn out cassette tape, which Dad already had to glue together once. It's so easy to fix objects by gluing them back together, for example. But how do you fix a relationship? Mom moved to the living room, and I was left alone, anxiously stealing glances at the window. How do you fix a relationship? Olya had trouble sleeping ever since we moved into this house. She would toss and turn or curl up into a ball under her blanket. Sometimes she would jump up in the middle of the night and turn on the VCR. Cartoons helped to take her mind off of all the troubles we had with the move and our parents. And then, Olya said she saw that giant flying monster outside her window. She became obsessed with it. Our parents did everything in their power. They tried every little trick to get rid of those ridiculous fears. Olya refused to sleep alone and didn't believe that the owl was just one of her nightmares. After tonight, I was unsure what to wake of my sister's words, what to think of it myself. Can nightmares be infectious? Just last night, I couldn't get a wink of sleep and ended up thinking of what to expect in my new school. There were a couple of days left before the beginning of a new term. My imagination drew long, twisting hallways that led to a classroom full of kids. But all the students behind their desks were simply dark figures, cut out using a template. Circular holes gaped in the middle of their faces, and pairs of eyes blinked inside those holes. It was as if some completely different creatures were looking at me from behind the flat, black silhouettes. Their cruel glares, filled with icy sneers, made me shiver from head to toe. Will I survive here? Won't they gang up on me and beat me down? Stomp on me with their bloodied shoes? The damn school can burn for all I care. I just wish for anything to happen to it. it doesn't really matter what. I didn't want to go there that bit badly. I didn't want to see people who are just itching to smack me on the head, trip me up, think of a new offensive name for me, worse than the previous one. I felt like the glasses I wore made me an outsider or some sort of monster. My gaze slid across the drawings hanging on the walls. I couldn't consider myself a great artist, but Olya begged me to hang them. Drawing was the only thing that made me happy as of late. The small circle of friends I had also enjoyed had also... The small circle of friends I had also enjoyed my paintings, and they promised to call me from time to time. Sometimes I imagined my mom picking up the phone and saying in a cold voice, You've got the wrong number. Or Anton is not around. Anton is not around. I imagined my future classmates lying in their beds, just like me, listening to the howls of invisible werewolves outside their windows. Maybe my new classmates will like me after all. But who would ever like a boy with thick glasses? I mean, my dad used to wear glasses when he was little, but, and now he's married to the most beautiful woman on the planet, my mom. The house creaked, pressed by the wind. The condo we used to live in, a nine-floor concrete building, buzzed with the neighbor's drill, mumbled with a TV set from behind the wall, cried like a baby from the big family next door. Our current house, though I can't really call it new, was completely different. It was silent and easy, going during the day. Its shadows lay dormant in the corners, on the closet, cobwebs, and under the stairs. But they all woke up during the night. Some t something was watching me from every corner, almost as if the old photos of my diseased family with their ashen eyes were hanging on the walls in the place of my drawings. The floor was squeaking, rusty drains were moaning, the attic was occupied by noisy drafts. One couldn't think the house was performing some sort of demonic melody. And then I realized I was, in fact, hearing music. It was already playing for a good while. Somewhere at the edge of my perception, I could hear a flute. It was mixed in with the sound of the wind of the creaking old house, and my thoughts, too. I stood up and rushed to the window. I wanted to reassure myself that this music was nothing more than a product of my imagination. 
It's not like someone is playing it there amidst the cold, snowy night, right? Someone was dancing in the field. Black silhouettes I could barely make out, with the dark forest as their backdrop. They jumped around, basked in moonlight, bumped into piles of snow, rolled around and crawled on all fours. Stories about wolves playing under the moon came to mind, but these were clearly not wolves. They stood upright at times, circled around, holding hands and whipping up snow, disappearing into shadows for a brief moment and then coming back. Something bizarre was going on. Shadows dancing in the starless abyss made my imagination go wild, making me anxious at the same time. Suddenly the music had stopped. The dancing shadows froze in place, and I could swear pierced me with their eyes. One of the silhouettes immediately parted from the bizarre shadow carnival and sprinted across the field with giant leaps. It glided on squeaky snow without leaving any prints until it was devoured by the pitch black shadow of my house, which became even darker and thicker. My heart was jumping around like the bird inside a cage. I shut the curtains with a swift motion and stepped back toward the bed. They saw me. A freezing torrent of fear washed over me. I stood in the middle of a perfectly dark room and listened to some unwanted guest move and scrape around, looking for an entrance. The sound moved to the right, then circled around the house. Now my guest should be at the front door. I jumped, into the, to the, bleh, I jumped into the bed and covered myself with the blanket as if I could protect me. The shackles of fear locked my muscles. I remember the funeral, my grandma lying there, hands crossed on her chest, her facial features sharp like that of a tin doll. Ants rumping, running up and down the legs of chairs that held my grandma's casket. I imagined those little creatures climbing up her head and pulling up her eyelids with her tiny legs. Then her wrinkly eyeballs would once again move inside their sockets and she'd be able to see her grandchildren. I was chanting the spell she taught me th throughout the whole procedure. And now, lying under the blanket and listening to squeaks and howls, I was repeating the same words. On the island of Buen, underneath the blemished sun and the sea of color blue, stands a cabin made of wood. Their lair, they li -la -la, there lay lard and ashen hair for the spawn from Devil's Lair to feast and always leave alone God's faithful servant named Antoine. Leave, evil leave this house must. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Bizarre sounds had disappeared. I cautiously peeked out from under the blanket and saw curtains waving around like a hangman. And then the night doused me with a new portion of boiling terror. The sound scratched at my eardrums. In reality, something or someone were scratching at the front door, hurriedly craw clawing at wood, demanding to be let in. The door was shut. Dad had become very cautious recently, so he installed a sturdy lock. I remember him staring at the force intently as if he was looking for someone. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. I hugged my knees, placing my chin between them, and drilled the door with my eyes. It was so flimsy and weak before the might of darkness. And then... The doorknob twitched, slightly. Then it turned halfway, once, twice, as if the person who tried to enter had no hands. The doorknob tilted once more, and then... It started clicking violently. My jaw cramped from fear. My wet fingers clutched the blanket. The door creaked and opened. The wind taunted me, moaning inside the tin trains. Now, now you'll see. The door was wide open. The darkness writhed inside the carnivorous mouth of the doorway. Tony. It was as if the night itself was calling out to me, flapping its black wings and squeaking with rusty hinges. It was trembling, ensnared by the web of darkness that hung in the corners of my room, waiting for the one who weaved it to come out of the gaping black hole. Tony. <laughs> I 
My abdomen tightened and my chest rose up, ready to excel a desperate scream. But before I was able to do anything, the darkness asked me, Tony, you asleep? My sister's pale face protruded from the thick shadows. I almost screamed from relief. Olya, I, I'm not sleeping. Did something happen? Olya frowned and stuck out her lower lip, a clear sign that she was about to cry. It's there again, staring at me. Shoo her away, Tony, please. I'm so scared. The fear that was the tormenting the fear that was tormenting me just a minute ago crawled away and hid somewhere in my stomach. I needed to calm Olya down. It was just a dream, silly. Don't be scared. Dreams don't bite. No one's going to harm you. Olya sobbed. She was trying her best to believe me. But was I sure myself? I have an idea. Let's go to your room and watch the video, Sleeping Beauty, for example. You like that cartoon, don't you? Why does the Sleeping Beauty have a print and I have this scary bird? That question took me by surprise. Alright, let's watch Cinderella. My thoughts became tangled, fuzzy. What was that? What studied me with its eyes while dancing feverishly under the moon? The darkness was clinging to the window, and it couldn't be fooled by Grandma's old chance. It couldn't be satisfied with a feast of lard and long ashen hair. Tony, you coming? Yes, yes, just a moment. <laughs> That's why I didn't want to laugh at Olya and her owl in the morning. Who could be visiting us here in the middle of nowhere? We don't know anyone around here. So persistent. I felt extremely unsettled just from a silly thought that our morning guests could have come from the woods. I could barely hear voices coming from the front door. My mind was urging me to hide in the closet, under the table, behind the curtains where Olya always hides. Tony, come here. I felt like kettlebells were tied to my feet, but still dragged them toward the hallway. A couple of policemen towered over me in the doorway. They smelled like frost and worry. My mom always winced and grumbled the moment she saw patrol cars, worse than bandits. At the moment, though, she looked somewhat confused. Hello? The senior officer, who wore a grim expression, nodded. A boy had gone missing yesterday. His name's Vova. Look at this, please. Have you seen him? The policeman held out a photograph to me. It's a kitty. There was a ginger boy around the age of ele elementary school, pictured with a wall carpet as the backdrop. He had a striped cat in his hands and wore a wide smile. No, I haven't. Are you sure? Look closely. Where would I see him? I don't know anyone around here. I barely leave the house. Well, maybe you've seen him from the window. That's right. Your windows look straight at the forest, don't they? The window. No, I haven't seen anything. I see. He sounded tired, but his eyes, his stare, long and heavy, was full of suspicion. I squirmed and unwittingly under the weight of guilt which his giant which his giant shadow cast over me. The policeman finally tore his eyes from me and glanced over the hallway, the stairway, and the cracks in the ceiling, which I haven't noticed before for some reason. How do you like your new place, by the way? Getting used to it? Bit by bit. Just her little daughter misses the city a lot. Misses the city, huh? Have the locals been treating you well? Yes, everything is alright, thank you. The policeman pierced through me one more time with his gray eyes. My head started spinning. Um, can I help you somehow? I asked that in a shaky voice to look like a polite boy and to end his unpleasant conversation sooner. Now that I think about it, you look just like one of my nephews, little fella. He's a witty boy around your age. Where's the same type of goggles? <laughs> Always engrossed in reading those mystery novels. Told me he wants to enroll in police school when his family visited this summer. 
wanting to help other people just like me, you see? I felt uncomfortable, as if a distant relative and not a police officer stood before me. You know what? Little boys like you should stay at home, steer away from trouble. The times have changed so much. Mom interjected in a cold voice. You don't say. Ah, well then. What grade are you in, Tony boy? Sixth. Have you made any friends here so far? Not yet. I'll be going to school for the first time after the break. Ah, then I'll leave you my number just in case. Call me if you have any new info. The policemen were gone along with their shadows, the smell of cheap cologne, and the photo of a smiling boy. His face stood still before my eyes. His face still stood before my eyes. I wondered what it was like for him, being all alone, there. For some reason I thought of the forest swaying in the wind. What did his poor parents feel? And what would my parents do if I had gone missing? Would they cry and thrash around hysterically? Or would they accuse each other like they always do and forget about me eventually? Mom, this Vova, did he go missing in our forest? Seems like it, poor child. I looked out the window at the road. The police UAZ drove off toward the village. The officer's nephew came to mind when I was splitting off old paint from the windowsill. I remembered all the teenage mystery novels from the Black Kitty series I've read this summer. Your average boys and girls investigated all sorts of mysteries there. They looked for clues, spied on suspicious people, and after a set of amazing adventures, BAM! solved any complicated case. They became local celebrities and must have made their parents very proud. I know a trail of policemen's footprints that led to the forest, and then it clicked in my head. Why don't I start an investigation of my own? Maybe I'll find that lost boy, and I'll get a reward. Olya will be so happy. Not only Olya, mom and dad too. Maybe they'll even forget about their quarrels for a while. Maybe I'll even save us from the D-word. I fantasized about buying Olya a Tamagotchi and getting a cassette player and a bunch of tapes for myself and a whole box of Kinder Surprise. When was the last time our parents bought us any toys? Last autumn, I think. My dad had lost his job at the time. There was that annoying song about it. I had little to no idea what was this. I had little to no idea what was the accountant's job like. They count money, I think. Neighbors used to envy us. But nowadays, Mom and Dad barely had money to afford sweets, and Dad would always divide a single chocolate bar between me and Olya. Sometimes I gave her my share, too. No matter how much I wanted to eat sweets, she was still just a pipsqueak. I couldn't wait to go out, looking for clues. I'm going outside. Yeah, right. You want the police to go around with your photograph next? The forest is so thick. What if the boy got snatched up by wild animals, or something even worse? Even worse, I go through the hallway. I won't go far. I'll stay away from the forest. Did you hear what I said, or should I repeat myself? Better go pack your school bag or play with Lolia. A sound of splashing water came from the kitchen. It meant that the argument was over and Mom had the last word. Ooh. The dark, stuffy closet. Mom says it smells like mice, but how would she know their smell? She hates when I stick my nose in there. She's afraid I'll cut myself in the freshly sharpened axe. And Olya can't even be lured close to it. She thinks Babai is living there. I tried to help her fight her fears once. I opened the door and turned on a dim lamp, so she would see there was nothing but cobwebs, dad's tools, and scratched walls. She still didn't believe me. And I like to hide in the closet and listen to all your count outside. One, two, three, better hide from me. And then drag her feet on the creaking floorboards, hoping that she wouldn't need to look for me in the cramped monster's den.
Imrakam of Russia has declared the state of emergency due to adverse weather conditions. According to the weather forecast, a cyclone is moving towards the region. Expect heavy snowfall blizzards and snowdrifts on the road. Keep your eyes open and take care of yourself. The decrepit and stain-covered calendar was once my favorite form of entertainment in Grandma's house. I remember waking up and running to the kitchen so I could tear off yesterday's leaf first thing in the morning, as if the coming day would get lost in the taiga forest without my help. One day closer to New Year's, one day closer to Grandma's funeral. Shit. I haven't touched this calendar for years now. Since the time I started writing dark and spooky death chants that only made me gloomy instead of funny proverbs and superstitions, to be exact. I grabbed a dusty calendar leaf with caution, and it tore off effortlessly. Sadly, the spooky descriptions from my childhood were still there. Seven horses carry the log. If seven can't carry, bring the eighth from a ferry. They will take it away and never come back. This is the fate the log cannot escape. I crumpled the gray leaf and threw it into the waste bin, hoping to get rid of the anxiousness that washed over me. It was spreading inside me like an ink stain on blotting paper. I took a peek at Mom's crossword. She would get very angry when someone gave her advice, so me and Dad faked knowing the answer and being about to reveal it all the time. I smiled at that fleeting thought. Vertical, nine letters. The name of the Philistine de deity that protected them from viper bites and had a nickname, the Lord of Flies. Second letter is E. Hmm. Among that still life picture hung a piece of ruled paper with the phone number of the police officer who visited us. First Lieutenant Tikhanov. Tikhanov. I read inside my mind, looking at the officer's sprawling handwriting. A scrap of paper was held by two pieces of a broken magnet from some old Soviet toy, and those pieces just barely covered up the numbers as if to taunt me. I leaned toward it to unveil the mystery and take the piece to a safer place where it would wait for its time when I would finally find Vova and be the first to call the police with the happy news. Anton. Mom's reproachful eyes stared at me. What do you need it for? Hands off, you'll lose it. Angering my mom was the last thing I wanted to, so I lowered my hand. Jeez, Mom. Grandma kept ice cream for me and Olya there, but now all I could see, now I could only see meat bits for soup and clumped together pelmena, pelmini, pelmini. I grew up to hate them already. Nothing exciting in the fridge. I guess we're going to the front yard. Anton. I'll whip you if you make a single step out the door. Not going outside. My parents prohibit me from making long distance calls, but from time to time I really want to hear my old friends. Sometimes I would just pick up the phone, listen to the low hum of the zoomer, and the distant crackling, imagining the wind howling in the ice leaden cords. Mom's peg top, family relic. My mom played it when she was little, then she gifted it to me. Oli was next in the succession. The Oli was next in the succession line. The toy belonged to her now. She started at the dancing spindle as if it could show her something. She stared, a fairy tale, or maybe even your future. Now even my little sister was a bit too old for the old squeaky peg top. Anton, get your ass out of the closet immediately. Jesus Christ, Mom. I need to distract my mom somehow or I'll get scolded and my ass wet from Dad's leather belt. Okay, distractions. I'm not dumb. I can do this.
It was difficult to lie to Mom, but there was no other way for me to run away from home. Mom, something's wrong with the TV. The picture is dim and there are stripes all over the screen. Mom's face became visibly distorted. Ugh, you're killing me here. So have you had enough of shooting those stupid ducks now? Told you the kin... Told you the kinesco... Kinesco... What the... <laughs> I'm awful. Jesus. We'll go dim because of your console. Where, where, where will we find a TV technician in this hole, huh? Maybe it's just the settings. Please go see for yourself. Strange. It worked fine this morning. Maybe the snowfall caused it. Mom rubbed her hands clean on her apron and went to Olya's room. Run for it! I opened the front gate and went into the field. Carefully, so Mom wouldn't see me from the window. When I crossed half the distance, the distance to the, toward the forest, the snow piles became as high as my knees. I remember my nightly fears. I saw those silhouettes around here. They were jumping around, holding hands. That hypnotizing music started playing in my head all on its own. In the light of day, those distant figures felt like a simple dream. The sun turned my nightmares to ash, but the aftertaste was still there. Distant ringing in my ears, distorted shadows crawling in the snow alongside me. And a barely audible whisper in my head, blurry and almost kind. Everything was silent. So silent I felt like the world was totally empty. No ground, no sky, no parents, no Olya. The time reached its limit, a one-way trip that ended at the forest piney stockade. Sometimes silence was so much scarier than any scream. Our parents would scream at each other while arguing, and both me and Olya turned to stone listening to them. But then always came the ringing silence. Our apartment became numb a couple of days before we departed. It was hard to remember the last time Mom and Dad joked around, laughing, or spent time together, almost like all of it was in a previous life. When they kissed with Olya present, she always frowned and snorted in a funny way. But one day it all changed. Something important had left our home, and something scary filled the remaining void. It was as if a fire broke up, and our parents were hurriedly packing our belongings, trying to save themselves and us. From who, though? From the people with dead, cold eyes who sometimes visited us in our previous home? The eyes that only saw balls of worms on the black ground and everything. And somewhere far away, a siren was going off, trying to warn us of the coming menace. I shuddered, chasing away my delusions, and looked around. There were only me, this white field, and the wind that was whipping up icy dust and belts of powdered snow. I squinted from the sun and turned my eyes to the sunless forest. It looked especially dark, especially dark, in the contrast with the blinding whiteness. Knobby tree roots slithered under the snow like fat snakes. Broughten leaves and coniferous needles froze into ice. Dry, prickly branches intertwined, bringing up uncomfortable thoughts about fences. Were they protecting the forest? Or were they keeping something from breaking out? Some object was hanging from one of the pointy branches. I tried to get closer, drowning in snow. When I almost got to the edge of, for ugh, edge of the forest, I saw a knitted mitten. It looked like a wounded bird among the hungering semi-dark. Should I take it to the police? The senior officer looked gloomy, but he still reminded me of Captain Casanova from my favorite TV show called The Streets of Broken Lights. He was also always anxious, with a tired look in his eyes, but still brave and strong. Will this mitten help them find the lost boy? Vova! I heard a distant shout. Looked like it came from the river. Vova! As if the trees were calling out to someone. Vova resounded closer to me. Someone was standing there behind the trees. Hiding. Vova. I knew someone was looking for the lost boy, but still, something was unsettling about that figure. Its stillness was bent unnaturally toward the ground. Its blackness. 
There's no one there. Just branches and roots. It's all just my imagination. A nearby bird flapped its wings loudly. The shadow split from the tree and disappeared from my sight. It looked away for just a moment, but when I turned my gaze back to the same place, it was gone. So it was my imagination after all. Silence reigned for a painfully long time. My muscles were tightly sprung. My heart was beating somewhere in my throat. Any noise, any little movement, any small whisper from the thicket and I'd sprint. But nothing of the sort happened. I looked at the mitten once more. I decided to take the lonely mitten from the branch. Vova! A shout rumbled across the field and dissolved in the distance. No echo. No hope for a reply. I stepped toward the bristly trees and tried to climb my find. It didn't budge. I pulled harder. The branch cracked and the mitten tore off. Landing in my hand with a squishy sound. All too heavy. Wet. I squeezed it without thinking of something dark spilled from it, forming a tiny string between the mitten and the snow. Steam rose from the snow pile. I froze in place, setting my palms in disgust. Red. The sound of crackling branches invaded the silence. I didn't have to think twice before running away. Someone was chasing me from the darkness, breaking pine branches, closing the distance with giant leaps. Snow was slowing me down. Crazy thoughts flew through my mind. I'll get caught. They'll get me. I'll get dragged into the thicket. I'll be gone. Forever. If there was one more voice, probably one of reason. It gave me strength, spurred me on. You can do it. Don't stop. I heard an animal roar behind me. It was so loud my ears went numb. It felt like the sound had come from a pack of hungry beasts rather than a single one. Their nostrils sucked in freezing air. They sensed my fear. Two giant wings flapped above my head. An enormous shadow flew over the clearing. A hoot, a wheeze. The roars were coming from all directions now. From the dried out raspberry bush, from twisted pines, from under the windfall. Hurry, run, don't look back. It felt like I was inside a nightmare. The snowy clearing became vicious like quicksand. It was stu I was stuck in place. I pulled my leg from the mushy trap just to be caught in a new one, even deeper than before. I continued to drown, sinking deeper and deeper with every desperate push. Was snow ever this sticky? I screamed in horror after realizing this wasn't snow. Someone or something in the snow pile was clutching my pants. I gathered all my strength and rushed forward. The pressure on my leg was gone. My boots slipped out of the hole and my soles were on a hard surface again. I reached a clear path with one jump and from there ran to my house. Its gloomy facade didn't look threatening now. That house was my line of defense from the shadows that flapped their wings and the creatures that were hidden under the snow. I tripped over the doorstep and smashed into the door. In all of my hurry, I still managed to notice the claw marks, as if a dog was striking the wood with its paws, demanding to be let in so it could escape the cold. I hadn't noticed these marks when I was leaving. The heartbeat of my ear was so much louder than my surroundings, I couldn't hear whether someone was following me or not. What if they were already in our front yard and Mom had locked the door? Drowning in fear, I pulled on the doorknob and it obediently gave way. Stress. I rolled into the hallway and shut the door behind me. Porch planks creaked as my pursuers ascended the stairs. My fingers slipped off the lock and I couldn't click it into place. I gritted my teeth and pulled hard on the iron knob, winking it between the boards. Whipping it between the boards. I stared blankly at the door. Someone was standing on the other side of the pitiful, flimsy barrier that was probably less useful than blankets. Wheezing breath reached into the house and crashed at me in waves. It smelled of pine and sweat. Mom peeked out of the kitchen and chastised me with the same frigid voice she had always used when talking to Dad. What exactly didn't you understand when I told you never to slam the door? I, I didn't mean to. I snuck a glance at the door. The smell was gone and the breath was too. 
If there was someone in the first place, of course. Here, mere five meters away from Mom, my fear was slowly weakening, melting like snow in spring, and with it, the last bit of strength I had left in my body, too. My legs gave way. I propped myself up against the wall so I wouldn't fall over. Mom's expression had changed immediately. The cold mass of strictness and detachment was gone. Mom looked the same as before all those quarrels. She finally saw my condition, my wet pants plastered with snow. Where have you been? What did I tell you, huh? I told you to stay home. Am I nothing to you too? I got afraid she would cry. I reached out to her like when I was very little and wanted her to cuddle me. But Mom regained her composure fast and put on her usual face. Her eyes shined like still. Her voice rang out. Your dad can't find his cigarettes. To be honest, did you snatch them? Were you smoking in secret? I... There, there was someone chasing me, I, I thought. I stuttered as soon as I started explaining myself. Tears welled up in my eyes. Mom leaned for, toward me and sniffed my clothes like a beast, searching for the smell of tobacco. Then she squinted her eyes in suspicion and looked in the front yard. Her expression changed in an instant. She covered her mouth with her hand. Look over there at the fence. My heart started thumping as if I became prey once again and my pursuers were following me in the field. I could swear that I've heard something scratch at the door just like in my nightmare. Mom beckoned me with her finger and I gathered all my remaining bravery to look into the kitchen window, facing my fear. I could barely discern some hairy silhouettes swimming in snow through the icy winter patterns on the glass. Dogs. Just a small pack of strays with no name or owner, barely reminding of the hungry monsters that live on the edge of the forest. Oh boy, were you scared of them? I think they'd rather be scared of you, Anton. They were chasing me, like a bunny. And what if they are rabid? The smile had slowly disappeared from Mom's face. Now she looked at the dogs as if it was her first time seeing them. What if they attack all you, Mom? I wish your dad could just shoot them all. Mom, look, they're alive. Huh? What? Are they your friend or foe after all? Make up your mind. You're not a little kid anymore. Mom sighed in annoyance, and I felt so bitter that I bit my lower lip and fixed my gaze on the cobweb reddened corner. Well, some detective I am. In reality, I wasn't risking my life among monsters, but rather my pants among a pack of stupid strays. And what for? What use do I have for this? Mitten. Of course. A dark and sticky mitten that belonged to the lost boy made a squishy sound in my hand. It seemed like I was clutching it the whole time. That's my trump card as a detective. I hurried to present this clue to my mom. Mom, look, this is Vova's mitten. That boy the police were asking about this morning. It's drenched in blood. I found it hanging on a tree. I can, sh I can show where. Let's call the police right away like the officer had told us to. Mom, look. Ew. A shadow of doubt slowly crept onto Mom's contorted face. As if she was trying to remember something distant. Like someone tries to remember their dream, but the images slip away. Stop it this moment. Olya will go insane if she hears you. She already has trouble sleeping and whines all the time. And you joke around like this? At the moment, I realized the mint was actually wet from snow. There was no blood whatsoever. I wanted to sink through the floor from embarrassment. Come here, my boy who crawled, cried Wolf. Oh, don't just stand there. Come take your pills. A golden-colored pill, reminiscent of a dead wasp, fell into my palm. I already took one during breakfast. Don't talk over me. I told you to stay home, and you... Dad would have given you a good whipping for that. Come on, take it, or you won't be able to sleep at night. And you have school tomorrow. So I had to swallow the bitter medification, medification, medication, drinking it down with a similarly, similarly awful water that gave off a taste of chlorine. Maybe it wasn't Bova's mitten. Maybe it wasn't a mitten at all. Just like the forest monsters and Olya's owl. Am I going mad? What's happening to me? Either the pill had an immediate effect, immediate effect, or my overexerted brain didn't let fear inside anymore. Serenity washed over me, bringing yawny indifference along with it. Anton, you done? See? You can do it when you try. Take off your coat. Are you asleep? No, Mom. I was just thinking. 
What about, I wonder? It's just something silly. Mom scrutinized me with suspicious eyes, as if she wasn't sure she was looking at her own son and not some doppelganger that had come from the forest. Is everything all right? You had this exact same expression when the policeman asked you about the window. I'm all right, Mom. She heaved a deep sigh. Fine. It seemed like the house had changed. The sofa's fabric had become discolored. Fingerprints appeared on the bathroom tiles. The light bulbs also felt different, dimmer and yellower. Even the saliva inside my mouth had a different taste. A melody from Aladdin could be heard from the upper floor. Olya was done rewatching her favorite Little Mermaid episodes and switched to other tapes. I slowly changed in my home clothes, stopped before the sink and studied my reflection in the mirror like I was trying to solve one of those spot the difference puzzles. Then I went upstairs. Jafar's and Lago's voices died down. I walked past Olya's bedroom and slipped into my own. Monsters, Ghosts, UFOs. The Encyclopedia of Paranormal Phenomena from Rossman Publishing. I've learned about the Loch Ness Monster, Medusa, Gorgon, and Bigfoot from there. Olya is always scared of the book. She could barely handle sifting through the monster and alien sections with me, but the middle part where they start to talk about ghosts really freaked her out. I even remember hunting ghosts after I'd read the book, measured the distance between items on my table every evening, and checked if they moved due to some supernatural force come the morning. They didn't. But to be honest, what was I expecting? To meet Casper the ghost? Triceratops figurine. I know about all sorts of dinosaurs, velociraptors, afrovenators, hypsolithovendalalalala. Yeah, you get the point. <laughs> I remember going to the movies to see Jurassic Park back when we still lived in the city and taking pictures with the T-Rex in the hall. It turned its head and roared. It was awesome. And next to it was a Robotech Transformer. I love this cartoon. When a jet fighter speeds up in the intro among the sounds of blaster fire, you know your next 20 minutes will surely be amazing. Zentradi space station is captured. Rick, get ready for battle. I've dreamt of becoming an artist since Dad bought me my first comic book. Fly magazine was the coolest. I especially liked the big space-related editions with alien monsters and that funny episode about a Gendarm, Gendarme. I started drawing all kinds of stuff since that day, and I seem to be getting pretty good at it. One of my letters even got published in Fly once. Maybe someday they'll even publish my comic. Oh shit. It's all ya. The forest didn't look as grim during the day. Entangled tree branches in the distance and the snowy field between our house and the forest brought sleepiness to my eyes. Sometimes I would still catch myself looking in the window at the icy tr treetops instead of doing my homework. Are we not going to acknowledge our sister? How strange I remember moving this curtain. One of the drawers were, was empty. I hid the mitten there. This simple action drained the last bit of strength from me. I sat on the bed, and only then I noticed there was someone behind the curtains. My tired hand dropped to the sheets. Whether it was due to medication I took or the stress I underwent, the room began to contort as if the wind was blowing the walls out like a pair of sails. The room's corners bent and undulated. The only stable thing in the whole room was the figure between the window sill and the curtains. A flimsy piece of cloth was, cloth was stuck in my hidden, stuck to my hidden visitor, just like a savant of sorts. Olya, who else would be standing there? I stood up and licked my dried-up lips. Yeah, Olya, it's so funny. The silhouette was unmoving. It was enveloped softly by the curtains, as if there was a thick layer of darkness there, not a human being. I reached towards the curtains, but Dom, but Dom, beat my heart. My control, uh, controlled by medication. The wind sang in the field with a chorus of voices. 
For a second I wanted to return to the bed, just lie down and watch the person behind the curtain, knowing full well they were looking back at me. They were looking without blinking, waiting for me to fall asleep. Plastic rings rustled against the holder when I pulled open the curtains. Gotcha! I knew it was you from the beginning. A blindingly bright halo lit up above Olga's head with a settling sun as the background. My sister was shining. When she was just a baby, Dad always used to say she was shining with happiness. I always felt, I always retorted, but Dad, she's not some flashlight. But I brought her to the window one day and sunlight poured on her smiling face. I felt like I was holding a child woven from light. I saw everything. Oh, really? What did you, what did you hide? She was just like my mom when she was little, before she put on her sad mask of tiredness and switched to her commanding tone of voice. It's nothing, just... Ollie ran up to the table, her eyes round, and asked, You stole something and hid it there. Are you a thief? What? Don't be stupid. I didn't steal anything. A clear image came to mind, that mitten hanging from a tree branch. What if I did steal it after all? From the forest, from the tilted figure standing behind black trees. Or oh, you could be selfish and stubborn when she wanted. Then show me. Swear that you won't tell anyone, then I'll show you. Olya wore a plotting smile. I swear on Mom's heart. And know she heard in one of the movies about the pioneers we've watched. Don't say things like that. Olya nodded and made a gesture with her hand, blocking her mouth with an imaginary key. She was filled with curiosity that was splashing in her giant eyes. I opened the drawer and Olya leaned in, holding her breath. It, liked the, it looked like there was not just a simple mitten, but some sort of exotic critter. Is this someone's mitten? She said that it, as if she couldn't understand what she saw. A certain boy lost it and got lost himself. Now you do understand how dangerous it is, dangerous it is for kids to wander in the forest, right? He must be really cold out there. Will they find him? They will. The police are going house to house showing his photo to everybody. Olya would traverse the room with care and press her tiny palms against the window. And why are they going to houses and not the forest? Are they scared? The question caught me off guard. The police aren't scared of anything. <laughs> yeah, right. Flashed in my cloud of mind. Do they really check every nook and cranny where darkness, cold, and whispers of icy branches dwell? If that's the case, how do they miss the mitten? Or did it appear later? For me. I changed the topic. As if trying to get Olya as far away as possible from the forest to thicket. We make it a reward if I go and find this boy by myself. A lot of stuff like in Field of Wonders. Sounds cool, right? Olya wasn't listening to me. She was piercing the forest with incredibly adult eyes, uncharacteristic for her. What if the owl got him? Nonsense. An owl won't be able to lift a human. But you know what? I was picking my words with utmost care. I forced them out of my overexerted brain. Stay away from the forest. I think it's... I think it's... How should I put it? It's cursed or something. Just like in a fairy tale? No, not like that. More like in that spooky tape Mom and Dad are hiding from us. Olya shivered and stole a glance at the window. I saw you running away. Someone was chasing you. No, it's just... I was hurrying back home so Mom wouldn't be, won't, won't be worried. As I looked at my sister, my heart was tearing apart. She was so fragile. It was so easy to stifle her light. A gust of wind and her small fire would be gone. You're lucky. Mom won't even let me go outside. I'm like a princess in the tower. Can't go anywhere. I'll die from boredom here. You're wrong. No one has ever died of boredom. And you have me, and your cartoons, and Mom and Dad will be good to each other soon. You know what I wish, I would wish for on my next birthday? I'd wish for Mom and Dad to turn into children so we could go and play together like we used to. Yeah, and if you'd make them as small as bugs, we could place them into a little box. Olya giggled and tugged at my sleeve. Tony, let's go watch Aladdin. 
Fatigue went over my desire to be of my little sister. I was washed over by some sort of heinous apath apathy. I'm too tired. I don't want to. Come on. It's so boring alone, and Mom is always busy. We can pick a cartoon you haven't seen before. I know all of our tapes by heart at this point. Not all of them. You haven't watched Peter Pan. Remember how you fell asleep in the middle of it? And so much happiness after that? Let's go, let's go. Maybe a bit later. Should I tell you how it ends? Let's leave that for tomorrow. I won't tell you tomorrow. I know, let's play hide and seek. No, Alia. Then draw me a dino. Alia, please. Draw it, draw it! Will you leave me alone already? I blurted it out without thinking, and then I was immediately taken aback. I'd never screamed at my little sister like that. Olya stared at me in shock. Her lips started trembling, a precursor to tears. My chest was seething with disgust and embarrassment. What's happening to me? I hurried to prevent Olya from crying. Alright, you win. Let's go watch cartoons for a bit. I don't wanna. I came up to her, put my hand on her soft head. Let's go. Let's go watch Peter Pan. Boo, you'll fall asleep again. I smiled and lifted her chin. Her eyes were wet and felt bottomless. I promise, I won't. And I'll draw you a full Triceratops later. Hooray! Tripe. Sarah Pops. Well, close enough. While you rubbed her eyes with the sleeve of her pajamas and a shining smile returned to her face. I'll go ask Mom for condensed milk and bread and you rewind the tape. The bread is fresh, just how you like it. Alright, just be careful not to spill the milk. Or you'll be yelled at again. Wanna bet I won't spill it? The tape is somewhere in the nightstand. Look for it. Olya disappeared into the doorway and I dragged my feet into the neighboring room. Jesus. Whoops. <laughs> uh, uh. Olya's countless toys. An old teddy bear is the main attraction here. Olya doesn't sleep without it. And she digs her nose into its fur when she sleeps. Uh. A piggy bank. Olya is saving money for a real puppy because Dad said that taking care of him will take a lot of money. Photon TV was gathering dust in the corner. All that was left was clicking the button on the front panel. The tube warmed up and a familiar white noise started dancing on the black screen. I almost reached out to turn on the VCR when the noise calmed down and a blurry image appeared before a moment. It was a dark tiger of force just like the one that saw my window. The picture split the screen in half. Something creepy resembling human speech was coming out of the speaker. Just a few moments later, the scenery was once again overshadowed by noise. Did it catch some rogue signal? Local TV station only really showed Soviet cartoons, and even that was pretty rare. And only just recently, I used to always watch Robotech before school. It was so awesome. Maybe I should tinker with the antenna. What if I catch this channel again? On the other hand... Olya had asked me to find the tape. It wouldn't be nice to disappoint her. But in my sleepy state, I didn't have the strength to do all of it. The picture finally cleared up. But the moment I rejoiced at finding that weird signal again, the TV started coughing. A voice barely coming through the cacophony. He was often seen. At the moment when small snowy hills were lined up on the screen, pierced with rickety crosses, and a male voice was narrating with a slow, mournful voice. 
It was a pitch black night at the cemetery. In that fateful dark time, little Senya met her fate at the fence of a monstrous thicket dweller. The locals call him none other than the Forest Master. I froze and did my best not to move, as if by doing that I could scare away the narrator I listened closely to his every word. The beast dealt with the helpless girl in a masterful manner. The camera pan across the snow with something black spilled over it, looking for ragged pieces of cloth that were thrown all around the place. I didn't want to think whether Senya's remains were wrapped in there, so I shut my eyes without thinking. The voice continued. Wolves are rare guests in these parts. Here's what tomorrow the old woman that lives in a nearby crypt had to say. A close-up shot of the face of an old homeless woman weary from life and alcohol abuse rattled on the screen. Yes, yes, such a fearsome beastie it is, worse than the rising dead. The old woman splattered saliva all over the rectangular mic. That's creepy. And the stink. It's like... The rest of her comparison was swallowed up by the sound of a horn. I've never felt anything like that. It was just stand there, yes, right where you stand, boyo, and pierced me with its eyes, right in the middle of day. It was so huge that when that one with glassy eyes, obscenities were covered by another beep. You know, they say that if this demon lays its eyes on you, it'll snatch you, put you into his bag, and you're done. But he won't touch me. Likes me, it seems. So, they even call me the Devil's Winch. And it's definitely true. The carnivorous monster will not touch those who fell to the level of forest beasts, going for the innocent child's blood instead. The Forest Master's presence is felt more and more in the outskirts of our country. Torn between believing in what was said and shrugging it away, I decided to record the remaining part of the documentary for some reason. I quickly grabbed the tape that was on the top of the TV and put it on the VCR without even looking at the cover. I pressed record, turning the sound up and paid attention to the slipping signal. It's not called the Forest Master for nothing. All the animals obey it, be they hairy or feathery, they're all precursors for its appearance. If you hear howls in the distance, that it most likely already knows where you live. If you find animal prints all over your doorstep and birds watching you from the trees, you'd better hide. It's already coming for you. And if you wake up at night and see a pair of eyes in your window, then soon, 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 soon. The TV suddenly went mad and looped the last word over and over, piercing my ears. I got goosebumps all over my spine. Me too, man. Me too. The tape ended and was rewinding to the beginning. The sound of rustling tape reminded me of leaves and the wind and the low howl of the beast. I woke up from my stupor and pressed the button. The VCR ejected the tape for a moment. I thought it was stained with saliva. But that was just the light from the chandelier making the black plastic glossy. And then I saw the cover. Oops, I recorded it over Peter Pan. Oh, fuck. That's what I get for hurrying. It was bad enough that I had ruined Ollie's cartoon, but I also put this creepy stuff over it. I can't let her see this. We'll drown in tears. I snuck a glance at the door. I could hear the clatter of glass and the squeaky floorboards. Olya oh, yeah, appeared in the doorway. You haven't started without me, have you? My sister brought the tray with unevenly cut bread and a whole can of condensed milk. Um... No. I was looking for the tape. Do you really want to watch Peter Pan? I do, I do. Turn it on already. Mom will come watch her Brazilian drama soon. Come on, thank fake detective. You know, I didn't like Peter Pan. Maybe we should watch Little Mermaid instead. I've already seen it so many times. And you promised me. She's so stubborn. I know, let's watch a couple of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle episodes first, deal? Olya frowned, but it ultimately gave up. She put down the tray and crossed her hands on her chest. If you want it so much, can you open the milk can? I'm afraid I'll cut myself with the sharp edges. As soon as I stood up, colorful dots popped up before my eyes and my sore legs were pierced by thousands of needles. Only when I reached the sofa, I realized that the can was already open. 
Oh yeah, it tricked me. Played me for a fool. My stomach became heavy. I wanted to rush toward the TV, my little, but my little sister was faster. She picked up the remote and proclaimed in a victorious tone, Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. As the remote's master, I command you to watch Peter Pan. I couldn't even open my mouth, and the VCR had already eaten the accursed tape. She'll play it, and then... Black crosses on unnamed graves, empty crypts, bloody scrapes on the snow, and the insane devil's winch. I better tell the truth. Well, you stop. I erased the end of your tape by accident. I'll trade it with you for two of mine. What do you mean? You couldn't erase it. Me and Dad had broken off all these plastic pins with a screwdriver. You can't record anything over my cartoons now. My little sister pressed the triangular button play button on the remote. I squeezed on the inside, awaiting the out of this world voice of the narrator. But I saw the duel between Peter Pan and Captain Hook instead. I sighed in relief. My head, heavy as a leaden ball, now rested in my hands. Oya smiled in joy. She put the tape on rewind and started spreading milk over her bread. And when the cartoon started, she forgot about everything in the world. As if she really got transported to the Neverland like she always wished. To be honest, I also imagined myself there, in a land where no one ever ages, where no one ever, no one argues over little things, where no one listens to fights and the sound of broken plates at night. But now Peter Pan's land was especially far away from me. My thoughts dragged on, stumbled upon the horned beast that awaited me among the trees, and the narrator's mournful voice haunted me, sliding over bushes and ravines. Like a winged carnivore would track its prey. I felt like I was dreaming with my eyes still open. Then my sister's scream pulled me back to reality. Tony, shut the curtains fast! Why? No one's watching you. It's dark, and when it's dark, the owl comes. I'm, I'm scared. I got out of bed, fighting my drowsiness, and closed the curtains. I did my best not to look outside toward the treetops, towards the taiga first, which seemingly drew closer and closer. Of course, it was just a visual effect from shadows of branches scraping the snow. Tony, Mom thinks I made the owl up. And Dad, too, thinks I'm a liar since I'm small. But the owl exists. Honestly, honestly, it does. You do believe me, right? That it comes every night and... and... I swiftly grabbed Olya's hand and looked her in the eyes. I was trying to transfer at least some of my courage and determination. But did I really have those qualities? Yes, I believe you, alright? Just don't nag our parents about it anymore. They're already dealing with a lot, so they'll just get mad at you. Come and tell me if anything happens. And don't look out the window. But it wants me to look. It doesn't matter. Act like it doesn't exist and never existed. Like it's made up. Just like Mom and Dad say. It'll get tired of waiting and fly away. It was madness. But after everything that's happened recently, I was more and more inclined to believe only as Al existed. We followed Peter Pan's adventures as if nothing had happened, as if the forest didn't kidnap kids, as if our parents weren't tearing each other apart bit by bit. Captain Hook was running away from a crocodile, and Captain Pan was headed to London on a gilded sailboat. By some miracle, I lasted longer than my little sister. Olya's eyelids had dropped. She started snorting slightly, lightly, resting her chin on the side of the bed. The chorus was singing the ending song. The world of Disney was lit up by this by a silvery moon. Another moon peaked from under the first one. Scary and wan, hanging over the Tiger Forest. The horrific report got recorded right over the credits. My throat went dry. My pulse became faster. I looked toward Oya. She smacked her lips in her sleep. I squeezed the remote with all my might, ready to press stop any moment. I rewound the recording, checked if it was intact, and then carefully took the tape out. The protective pin was still in place. I stood up and left Olya's room. Whether it was by providence or by curse, I hid the tape alongside the mitten at the exact moment Mom peeked into my room.
Enough playing around. It's your first day at school tomorrow. Go to bed. You should sleep properly. You don't want to be teased for being sleepy, right? Teased for being sleepy? Really, Mom? Ugh, adults think everything is so simple. As if sound sleep would ensure my classmates would like me. I covered myself with the blanket up to my neck and listened to the house humming to something invisible rustling in the corners. My inner voice had a question for me. Do I want to hear that mysterious flute again? Yes or no? Maybe it's just a part of growing up and I can't fully understand my own desires. The force wailed behind the barrier that was my walls. Some ethereal, ethereal entity wandered the fields. Branches shook as if calling for me. The wind howled on and on in the night. My thoughts were like annoying flies that entered my head before becoming weak and tangled. I didn't notice how I fell into slumber. Thank you for completing episode one of Tiny Bunny. Did you enjoy it? Do you want to know what happens next? We're already working hard on the continuation of the story. All right. And that's Tiny Bunny, guys. Uh, I think they did a fantastic job. I definitely got goosebumps multiple times from the just not knowing what was going to happen. So I'm definitely going to be continuing this series as soon as they release episode 2. So thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and sub just like the anime girls are saying at the top. And uh, hearts out.